Good evening, I'm Emily Parsons, Deputy Director and Curator for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this virtual author's talk. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, exhibitions and other public programs, advocating preservation and providing resources to classrooms. Since 1938, the society has done this work from its headquarters, Anderson House, a National Historic Landmark finished in 1905 as the winter residence of Lars and Isabel Anderson in Washington, DC. Today's author's talk features Dr. Catherine Carte of Southern Methodist University, discussing her recently published book, Religion and the American Revolution, an Imperial History. For most of the 18th century, British Protestantism thrived as part of a complex transatlantic system that bound religious institutions to imperial politics. As Dr. Carte argues in her book, British imperial Protestantism pr proved remarkably effective in advancing both the interests of empire and the cause of religion until the war for American independence disrupted it. The American Revolution forced a reassessment of the role of religion in public life on both sides of the Atlantic. Her book demonstrates that if religion helped set the terms through which Anglo-Americans encountered the imperial crisis and the violence of war, it likewise set the terms through which both nations could imagine the possibilities of a new world. Catherine Carte is Associate Professor of History at Southern Methodist University, specializing in early American and Atlantic history, particularly the history of religion and its intersection with politics. Dr. Carte is the author of Religion and the American Revolution and Imperial History, published just this June, as well as Religion and Prophet, Moravians in Early America, published in 2009 as well as articles in the William & Mary Quarterly and other journals. She earned a PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Crote's current research focuses on religion, human difference, and cartography in the early modern era. She is also writing with Matthew Avery Sutton, a new US history survey textbook for Bedford Macmillan entitled One Nation Divided. A little housekeeping before I turn things over to Dr. Carte. After the lecture, we'll have a question and answer session. So please submit questions for Dr. Carte using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technology related concerns or questions, you can submit those using the chat function and our staff will be monitoring those and helping to uh, do whatever we can. Now, please join me in welcoming Catherine Carte. Thank you so much for that um, great introduction. It is just such a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank you, Emily, and and thank all of you and the and the society and the institute for um, your interest in the American Revolution and all of its manifestations, and also in um, in my work. It's it's just wonderful to get a chance to talk to you all about what I've been working on and and what I wrote about in this book. Um, to start with, I want to ask what stories we tell about the American Revolution and religion. Um, we have tended to tell stories about that quite a lot, and most of those stories have been stories about um, Americans and their attachment to religion and to freedom. So some connection between religion and freedom that sort of is born within the American Revolution. And those stories have, have two different sort of places that they inhabit, and I want to just kind of think a little bit about what that is before we kind of get into the, the meat of what I want to talk about today. The first is, is we tend to think about religion as playing a role in the causes of the American Revolution. And in this, we can take our cue from John Adams, who in 1815 very famously said that um, Episcopacy, which is the having of bishops, um, he wrote, who, who will believe that the apprehension of episcopacy, fear of bishops, contributed 50 years ago as much as any other cause to arouse the attention, not only of the inquiring mind, but of the, of the common people. So that this, you know, fear of bishops was actually a primary cause in getting people involved in the American Revolution. And that's, that really kind of encapsulates one way we tell these stories about freedom and religion, that it was, it was fear of religious tyranny that encouraged colonists to sort of band together and fight against the British. 
The other story we tend to tell is about the consequences of the American Revolution. And there's, of course, a big gap between causes and consequences, but these are the two places that religion comes up. So this other place is this kind of split narrative. And, and this is kind of the end point that I want to get to today is to think about how we can get to this split narrative. Um, and those that narrative is embodied in these, these two different quotes, very famous quotes from these two presidents. On the one hand, we have Thomas Jefferson, who in 1802, in his letter to the Danbury Baptists, wrote, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislator should make, legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. And this is, of course, a, a statement that is controversial even till today. We still talk about, you know, to, to what extent does that embody the spirit of the revolution? That's part of that divided heritage. The other part of that divided heritage we can see in another quote from John Adams, this time when he was president in 1798. He wrote, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So he implied that we had to be, that the United States had to be a religious people, which for him really meant a, a Protestant people in order to function as a as a um, as a republic these are, these are two really different ways of interpreting religion in the american revolution in its, its consequences and so that's sort of our end point so what we need to do to understand how we get between these two points and how we get to this end point where we've got a divided legacy about the nature of religion and freedom in the united states this is this is still sort of a politically alive issue we need to reframe the story what i want to focus on here in reframing the story is the way that stories work right stories have beginnings middles and ends um, the beginning of our story when we're talking about religion in the American Revolution is actually not the American people. Um, if we go back to the period before the American Revolution and we want to understand how it came about, we need to understand how religion operated for the empire that, that split into the United States and Great Britain, so the British Empire before the Revolution. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by reframing this story around what I call British Imperial Protestantism, around the um, the way that religion operated to bind together the whole of the British Empire. And then in that context, we can look at the imperial crisis, at the consequences of the war itself, and at the way that, um, that people in the United States then set about sort of picking up the pieces of what had happened through the course of the war. And that's really what gets us to the point of understanding this divided legacy that religion and the revolution has bequeathed to us. So to start with, what was British imperial Protestantism? And those are, you know, we don't use the word Protestantism a whole lot anymore. Um, it's what exactly does it kind of refer to? You know, Protestants or Western Christians who aren't Catholic. That's kind of a religious understanding of it. What I want to do is kind of outline what an 18th century British understanding of this term is. So we can kind of understand where people started. And I actually think this, this image that we have here on the screen, this portrait of, of ministers, this is a portrait that, or a painting that's in, um, in a museum in Boston now. Um, I think this painting does a beautiful job of visually rendering that image. Um, in the book, I use the I use the metaphor of a scaffolding to describe how these religious structures sort of encircled the empire and pulled it together. But I think this, this picture really works for that too. You've got kind of the architectural side of it where you have the, um, you know, those pillars and the, the framing. And within those pillars, sort of the, the work that's going on, the work of religion is being done by this group of men um, all white men wearing identical clothing, although they are probably not all from the same denomination. Um, and they are sitting together using the tools that they have, using pens and, and texts and scripture in order to oversee the spiritual care and the religious purpose of the entire empire that you can kind of see re represented on the other side of that um, of that painting. So this is, if you want to visualize British imperial Protestantism, Protestantism I think that's the, um, the best way. But to get started, I want to kind of outline what it looked like legally. Um, and to do that, we actually have to go all the way back to the 17th century and the wars of religion that happened in Great Britain during the 17th century and then the settlement at the end of those wars. 
So during the 17th century, Britain fell into a series of, you know, very complicated civil wars that were um, in large part driven by conflicts between Puritans and members of the Church of England. There's a lot of warfare. It's a really devastating time. You know, the, there's the restoration. Charles II comes in and becomes the becomes the king when they restore the monarchy, but that doesn't quite solve everything. Um, and when his younger brother becomes king and is Catholic, this is James II, um, the people of England in particular, but also of, of Scotland and Wales come together and say that a, a Protestant people cannot be ruled by a popish prince, by you know a, a Catholic monarch. So he gets kicked out and William and Mary um, come in and become the new Protestant monarchs of um, of Great Britain. So what they do to kind of move beyond that sort of lengthy period of religious warfare is they construct a constitution, they construct a system of governing the, um, the British Isles that brings together more than one church. And this is really one of the most important pieces about that word Protestantism, is that Protestantism is an umbrella term that brings together different churches. So specifically in this case, we're talking about the, the Anglican church in, in England, we're talking about the Presbyterian church in Scotland. Both of those are established churches with official rights in, uh, in Great Britain, and then the Congregationalist Church in the colonies. So the settlement that comes together in the period after the Glorious Revolution, and that really sort of shapes colonial religion across the 18th century, is this idea that if you are loyal to the king, if you are loyal to the, um, to the stability of the state, and you are a Protestant, right? So if you are one of these um, these churches that all kind of look a little bit alike. Um, they all have, you know, services on Sunday. They all have educated clergy. They use roughly the same um, Bible. They have, they agree on almost all theological points. If you're within that kind of realm, then you're okay. You're accepted. Um, so the, the different groups can compete against each other, but they can all also continue to exist. They can't sort of push each other out of existence. And that's really kind of the baseline when we're talking about religious establishment in the 18th century. If you're one of the part of one of the dominant denominations, you're pretty much okay. Um, and then other groups kind of get pulled into this system. So um, say German or Dutch Protestants or French Protestants who move into the British Empire, they're kind of unintended beneficiaries of this system. They're not religious troublemakers, so they're fine too. They won't be persecuted. So we have this kind of terms of toleration. This is sort of an ideological commitment to freedom of religion. Almost every part of the empire has an established church. That's really important. They're committed to establishment, but they don't have one established church. They have three established churches. And so they have to kind of work between these systems and that gives a lot of space. So that's kind of the framework that we're talking about when we're talking about British Imperial Protestantism. So the system as it develops is the, the British talk about it as the constitution and church, and church and state. And after the glorious revolution, the, the key thing is that the monarch is a Protestant. And I think that actually stayed the case until, um, until they, you know, they redid, uh, the British redid the act of succession, I think actually even after um, uh, the Duchess Kate was pregnant. So, you know, it was very, very recent, right? Before that, you had to be a Protestant to be the head of the, um, to be the monarch of, of England. Um, and you really, within that, get this kind of intense connection between church and state that's not just funding of the church. It's the church and the state or the churches, right? These different churches and the state collaborating to legitimate um, the projects that the empire is engaged in. And the king is committed to upholding more than one of these churches to protecting all of them. So you sort of get this collaboration built into the system. Because this system is the result of serious conflict in Great Britain, and especially because it's it's built into the bedrock of the union between England and Scotland, so the Act of Union itself requires the protection of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, um, and the king swears to that in his coronation oath, because it's, it's located there in the British Constitution, it's bedrock. It is far more important to the structure of the British Empire than any kind of religious conflict that's going on in the colonies or any kind of um, minor issue. This is bedrock to the way Great Britain fun functions as a single state. <laughs> 
So this builds what I call a mixed Protestant establishment, imperial Protestantism as a mixed system. So there's an establishment, meaning there is preference for legitimate religion that is legal, that is material, that is very real, but it's not a single church. And so we get this kind of competition between denominations alongside privilege for those denominations. And I think the best way to kind of get into this is to think about the experience of a single American who some of you may have heard of, Samuel Davies. Um, Samuel Davies was a was a Presbyterian minister um, born in the 1720s, and he has kind of an awakening experience. He becomes a part of the movement that we associate with the Great Awakening with George Whitfield, um, and so he's, he, he becomes a clergyman, and while he's doing that, George Whitfield is traveling around, and Whitfield goes through Virginia, and, and Virginia has an established state church, which is Anglican. It's part of the Church of England, um, and, you know, Whitfield is an Anglican, but many of the people who are drawn into the awakening movement by Whitfield are frustrated with the kind of limitations of the Church of England. They're frustrated with the culture of the Church of England. They think it's kind of stayed. Um, and so a group of people gather together and they call a, a Presbyterian clergyman who will be sympathetic to the awakening movement because there aren't that many of them in Virginia at that time. In the, in the established church. So they call Davies and Davies comes down um, to Virginia and he is wildly successful. So he starts, um, he brings in assistant, assistant ministers and he starts leading church services and there is a real vibrancy to the awakening movement in Virginia. And it is very distressing to the elites of the Church of England who like a very kind of staid religious culture that doesn't interfere with some of the kind of, um, uh, you know, horse racing that they do and the the drinking that they do and is, is kind of a, a tame church. So the awakening movement starts to put pressure on that system. So leaders in the Anglican church decide that they need to lobby to, you know, sort of get rid of this awakening movement. And first, what they do is they try to deprive Davies of his right to preach. And he resists that. And he says, I'm a Presbyterian and I am ordained by a legitimate synod from Pennsylvania. And its authority in some ways reaches back to the Church of Scotland. And I am a legitimate Protestant minister here. And you can't, I'm a legitimate dissenter and I'm a loyal, I'm loyal to the state. I will swear allegiance to the state. So they can't get rid of him on that, on that front. So as the conflict sort of spew, you know, um, brews, both sides decide that they're going to reach across the Atlantic because both of these of these groups are deeply enmeshed in transatlantic networks. They decide they're gonna reach across the Atlantic to find a solution to the problem. They're gonna get the political leverage that it needs to, that they need to kind of bring this to an end. So Davies, for his part, even as the Anglicans are writing up the church hierarchy of the Church of England, they're writing to the Bishop of London, who's the head of the, of the Virginia church, Davies also writes across the Atlantic, and he writes to a man by the name of Philip Doddridge, who's a very important um, dissenter, meaning he's not a part of the Church of England um, in Presbyterian, he's Presbyterian in, um, in, in, in London. So Davies writes to Doddridge and explains that he is being persecuted, even though he is a loyal Protestant. But the reason we know that Davies did this, and this is important, this is in 1750, the reason that we know that he did this is because this letter is in the, the archives of the Church of England in Lambeth Palace. And the reason it's there is that Doddridge, when he gets this letter from Davies, says, I'm not going to just write back to Davies and try to tell him, you know, buck up, fight the good fight. He's going to try to solve the problem in England. So he takes an extract of this letter and he sends it over to his buddy, the Bishop of London, because these religious leaders are collaborating in different places. So the Bishop of London and Doddridge, this very significant figure in, in the dissenting movement, the awakening movement, they get together and they talk about, you know, what are the limitations on dissent? What's a, what is a loyal Protestant? What are they allowed to do? And they basically agree that this colonial problem needs to go away, that it's not really that important, which from their perspective in London, it isn't. So these letters keep passing back and forth across the Atlantic. Some of the Anglicans in Virginia actually get very frustrated that um, one guy gets a letter that includes quotations from, he finds a letter that includes quotations of a letter he had sent to someone else that he hadn't given permission to share. So like the communication networks are going all the way around. Um, 
the end of the story is that the Privy Council gets involved, which is the, the political body at the head of the, um, of the colonial structure. The Privy Council says this is not an acceptable conflict. Um, and they actually say religious conflict is bad for trade and that the Anglicans cannot persecute the Presbyterians out of existence. And so everybody back off, right? And so the conflict goes away. And this is actually pretty typical of the kind of conflict we see both in the colonies and in England, that people who are competitive, who might have theological disagreements or just turf wars, they'll kind of start stirring up trouble. The larger structure tells them that's not acceptable unless the trouble is disruptive to the state. So if you're you know, burning Bibles in the street, you're gonna be arrested, not because you're a bad religious leader, but because you're disruptive to the state. In other words, that's not a religious conflict, that's a public nuisance. Um, so if you're within that protected realm, you can continue to continue to function. In exchange for that, people like Davies, who are not a part of the established church, are intensely loyal to the empire. Davies was the writer of a whole series of incredibly significant sermons during the period of the Seven Years' War, where he is working to make sure that all of his congregants, the people in Virginia, particularly in Western Virginia, are willing to fight the good fight against the French, against their indigenous allies to support the British cause. Um, and he does this, as, as you, know, you can see on this title page, he does this on days of, of fasting that are declared by the you know, royal authorities and by colonial authorities. So he participates in those state structures. He gets privilege and he also gives support to the state. So that's how this kind of mixed establishment works. The metaphor I said that I used before is, is scaffolding. Um, scaffolding is made up of pillars and planks in my imagining here. Um, the, the, pillars, um, the pillars of this of this system are those establishments. It's those system, those legal structures and connections between church and state. The planks then are the connections that religious communities build up while that system is in place. So for most of the 18th century, um, religious communities are corresponding with each other. They're migrating around the Atlantic. And so they're you know, taking their communities with them. They're taking their clergy with them or they're writing back home. They're sending texts back and forth. They're sending money around. So this little map is, is just kind of a visualization of, of my research. What I did was you know, find correspondence um, across great distance, so across the colonies or, you know, distances in Great Britain or across the Atlantic um, between Protestant leaders. Um, and so, and they really are sort of communicating fairly constantly across, um, across the Atlantic throughout this period. Um, and then they participate in a whole lot of shared rituals. They do a lot of fasts and thanksgivings. These are really important moments where church and state come together. Um, they also do a lot of fundraising. This is another pamphlet from, from Davies when he, he he's, He's preaching to um, enslaved Africans in Virginia, and he wants more money and more texts to do that. He writes back to England. Most of his funders in England were actually a part of that Church of England that he was pissing off in Virginia. So he's very careful to make it clear that he doesn't have any problem with Anglicans, with the Church of England. His problem is that he's run afoul of a few people here, but he needs money. He needs support from, um, from British Anglicans, and he gets it, right? And so this, these connections are, are um, very important in shaping the way people talk about religion and also shaping where they put their religious activism. And they also have a lot of voluntary societies, groups. There's a whole alphabet soup of this, Society for the Promotion of um, the Gospel in Foreign Parts, the Society for uh, Promoting Christian Knowledge, and then there's a whole alphabet soup after that of religious voluntary societies that bring sort of average people into the process of promoting religion in places that the empire has touched, whether that's okay. preaching to indigenous people, preaching to enslaved people, or any number of other, um, other forms of, of um, outreach. So that's our before. So before the revolution, we had this robust Protestant system that pulls colonists and people in Great Britain into a sense that the British Empire is the best vessel for promoting true religion, that if they want to bring targets of missionary work into the fold, if they want to realize the best sort of religious lives they can for the people in their communities, they need to do it as part of the British Empire. So the question becomes, how could people then turn on that British Empire in a religious context, right? So how does that, how does that change? Now, if we look at the imperial crisis, what we see is, in fact, religion does not 
caused the American Revolution. So, and by that, what I mean by that, um, and I'll be a little bit more specific in a second, but what I mean by that is that religious networks and religious communities did not become sites of organized dissent against the empire. Um, those structures held through the imperial crisis. Let's look at a little bit more specifically what this means. Um, you may have heard of Jonathan Mayhew, and he's he's um, a significant figure in, for people who talk about religion in the revolution. Um, he was a minister in Boston. He's actually quite a liberal minister. He's out of step with a lot of his more conservative theological um, neighbors, although that's not a huge problem from them. They sort of agree to disagree. They don't all go to the same parties, but that's okay. Um, but he preached, actually, in, uh, in 1750, he preached a really important sermon called A Discourse Concerning Unlimited Submission and Non-Resistance to the Higher Power. So he, he, what the sermon is about is when are you justified in standing against civil authorities? That's really important. John Adams talks about this sermon later during the Revolutionary Crisis and after the war. This is one of the ones he pulls on to say this is how the spirit of our faith led us into um led us into the into the war and this is the one context where i think we really can see some inspiration for some people involved in the revolution so some people who were intellectually engaged in this and were turning to their clergy to ask questions um, they had resources like mayhew's sermon saying yes there are moments when it's important to stand against civil authority but the way he says it is really important he says it at a fast day that's determined by the British Empire's sort of calendar, right? This is on the um, on the uh, the de the anniversary of the death of Charles I during those those wars, um, and in that document, he actually supports the 1750. This is way before the Revolution. He actually argues that the uh, glorious Revolution and bringing in um, the Hanoverian succession, bringing in the Georges, um, when Queen Anne didn't have an heir, um, bringing in the next sort of Protestant heir. Um, those that those moves were legitimate, right? So he makes his argument for the ability to resist civil authority through a statement that is essentially loyalty to the British Empire. So those two things are sort of coexisting. But now the story gets a little bit more complicated when we look at the imperial crisis itself. So Mayhew didn't, didn't live all the way until the war, but he did live through the Stamp Act crisis. And during the Stamp Act crisis, he preached another sermon. Unfortunately, the sermon is lost. We don't have it. The text, I'm sure he ripped up the text afterwards. He preached it um, to a kind of rowdy crowd. Um, and the next day, they went and tore down the house of um, Thomas, Thomas Hutchinson, the um, lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. They, this the house you see pictured here, they ripped it apart. Mayhew was appalled. Because religious leaders, while they might theoretically support resistance to civil authority, did not support, you know, these, these are clergymen, right? They did not support um, theft. They did not support public violence for the most part. Um, and so he, he was appalled. He actually writes to Hutchinson the next day and says, oh my gosh, I told them not to take abuses with their liberties, right? He specifically tries to distance himself. He does not explicitly speak out against the Stamp Act in the sort of sermon form in the way that would have been a successor to his earlier stamp or his earlier protests. Although he and almost almost you know, across the political spectrum, um, Americans believe the Stamp Act was bad policy. Mayhew agreed that it was bad policy. He didn't support the policy, but he didn't argue for violent resistance. And the Stamp Act protests were actually pretty violent. Clergy stayed back from that, not just Mayhew, most clergy, um, with just a few exceptions, stay back from that. And then, very interestingly, they come in to argue that the Stamp Act was problematic when it's repealed, right? Because the repeal and the days of Thanksgiving that are declared for the repeal of the Stamp Act opens up this rhetorical space for them to talk about the triumph of British Protestant liberty. So they can work within that language they've used in the past, support you know, loyalty to the state, support public order, and also point out that um, this was bad policy, which it was. Um, 
So at that moment, they're able to do that. So that's where we see religion kind of coming into this conflict. On the one hand, there are some ideas that sort of filter together that influenced some people. That's very, very difficult to quantify. And then on the other hand, we see religious community, religious leaders and religious organizations mostly speaking out in ways that are fairly safe, not very disruptive to the system as a whole. Now let's come back to that issue of the bishops controversy that um, that John Adams talked about. So John Adams said that this is the issue that drives everything. And here again is a place where we can say, oh, not so much. So remember that constitution and church and state. So the religious leaders across these different denominations who are benefiting from this structure, one of the things that holds them together is that they submit to the authority of parliament the king and parliament, this constitution and church and state that I think is really kind of represented in this in this image that although this is Westminster, this isn't uh, that's not actually the halls of parliament um, that that system is very, very powerful. And so in order to get a new bishop, if the if the colonies had if the, Ang the Anglican church in North America doesn't have a bishop and some people want one, so they've been wanting it for a very long time. This isn't a new issue um, during the, the colonial crisis. There are some new voices that say, yes, we need a new we need a bishop. The important thing is everyone in this system is deferring to the authority of parliament. And in the 1760s, parliament, having built this structure that eliminates or at least severely tamps down religious conflict, parliament does not touch the bishop issue. So the most important thing about the bishop controversy and to understanding the bishop controversy is that it was a non-starter. It, it never came up for parliamentary discussion, which means it only operated at the level of conspiracy theory. Now, conspiracies are really powerful. I mean, we see in our own day, right? Conspiracies get people really riled up. Um, but it's difficult to translate that conspiracy thinking into action items. So an example of that is, you know, this, this portrait here. And again, all of these guys essentially look the same. And that's a part of the story. This is um, Thomas Secker. He's the Archbishop of Canterbury during this period. And he, uh, he really wanted a bishop and if any, a bishop for the colonies. And if anyone could have pushed that agenda, it would have been him because he had both the position and the political will. However, he knew it wasn't going to happen. So anytime it gets brought up, he, he squashes that actually in sort of back channels. People will write to him and say, we need to have a bishop for the colonies. And he'll write back and say, nothing doing these, this is, this is, you know, this, and this is during the period of the Stamp Act crisis and other problems with um, colonial taxation. There is no way that parliament is going to upset the religious apple cart in the middle of the Stamp Act crisis or in its immediate aftermath. They want taxation and they stick on taxation as the issue that they're going to, um, that they're going to manage. So as an example of this conspiracy, we get things like this, this pamphlet that's published after Secker dies that shows that he was trying to engineer a, a bishop for the colonies, which of course he was. It didn't happen. So what happens with the bishop controversy, what does happen with it, is that it fizzles. And if we look a little bit more closely at, at Adams's quote, this is actually embedded in his quote. He says that the bishop controversy urged people, even common people, to close thinking on the constitutional authority of parliament over the colonies. That's the core issue. It's the question of whether parliament has control over the colonies. And Parliament gives the colonists plenty of reasons to object to the execution of their authority that have nothing to do with religion. Now, absolutely, if Parliament had moved on the bishop issue, this would be a totally different story. But they don't. Instead, they move on the issues of taxation. We have the T Act, you know, the Intolerable Acts. All of these are focused around issues of sovereignty and taxation, and they don't touch on issues of religion. And that's really important. Parliament makes an active choice not to disturb that religious settlement, which is in theory tamping down controversy across the empire. The place where we do see religion playing into the imperial crisis is after the conflict starts. And this is a really famous painting of um, a man by the name of Jacob Duchesne, who was an Anglican, 
um, who was asked to come in and pray in the First Continental Congress. Um, and before this, and this is another Adams story, Adams gives all the best stories here. Adams uh, discusses this moment and he says that he tells us that one, one of the delegates to the First General Congress says, um, we should have a prayer to open this up. And someone else, I think John Jay says, no, we can't. We are too divided in religious sentiments. You know, they don't have any guardrails here from imperial Protestantism in this, this revolutionary system. And so he's, you know, don't, no, we're not going to pray because that's only going to cause a problem. And Samuel Adams speaks up and says, I will listen to any good preacher who is loyal to his country, by which he means the United States or the, the colonial protest and not even the United States yet. And so they go down the they go down the road and they get this awakened Anglican preacher Jacob Duche and he comes in and gives this incredibly moving moving sermon. So why why do we see these religious leaders at these important moments? That's the question. What happens as the crisis really builds to its crescendo? As we have the first General Congress and then the second Continental Congress and the Declaration of Independence, what we see is that from the the sort of baby state level up through those those um, bigger assemblies, those more national assemblies, people who are in those in those assemblies who want to legitimate religious, um, who want to legitimate the revolutionary process that they're engaged in, they lean on religious leaders in the same way that the British Empire had been leading on those religious systems before. They pull on that structure of legitimacy and a fair number of clergy, a substantial number of clergy, sometimes because they're sympathetic to the movement and sometimes because they um, feel that it's the right thing to have a, a religious voice at this moment. There are some loyalists who preach in these kinds of moments, um, they stand up and they say, yes, you do need this religious support at this moment. And that's what Duche is doing here. Now, Duche, although he supports the Continental Congress at this moment, Duche actually tries to get Washington to uh, negotiate a peace uh, later in the war after the Declaration of Independence, and Duche actually gets driven out of um, driven out of Philadelphia. Um, and so, even though this painting, this is a 19th century painting, is all, which is also in stained glass in Philadelphia, this moment is memorialized for um, people who want to see a very powerful role of religion for the for the American Revolution. That individual clergy person was not on board with um, with independence, and that's the complexity we. We need to see here. It's these structures working together, kind of pulling on legitimacy, trying to create legitimacy for, um, for the revolutionary cause. So that brings us to the war. Um, the war, you know, so this is if the story has a beginning, middle, and, and end. The middle is that kind of imperial crisis and then this destruction, right? So um, much about the imperial crisis doesn't really touch that those sort of pillars and and um, planks of the of the um, Protestant establishment because people are focused on other things. The war really damages them though. So what we see happen during the war is first of all people have to take sides. Um, on the one hand, uh, loyalists ac accuse many clergy people, particularly northern clergy people, of being a black regiment. Um, that's a phrase that comes from a loyalist, um, a loyalist writer. So, and this is a, you know, this is a, a later portrait of, of John Witherspoon. Um, the idea that uh, who serves in the in the Continental Congress for for New Jersey. Um, the idea here is that these people are um, animating the, uh, the revolutionary cause. And of course, clergy people and religious leaders in general are supposed to have this kind of special power to sway um, people because religion lives someplace that's maybe a little bit less rational. That if, if your clergy people convince you that you should do something, you will do it. Um, and so the influence of these religious leaders is supposed to be super important. So you do get accusations of the, of the of the Black Regiment. And you do get a lot of religious leaders who actively participate in the American cause, whether that's as chaplains or, you know, sometimes as soldiers or just, you know, lending their public support, however. On the other hand, we get a lot of people, including um, a, a really high number of Anglican clergy who've sworn allegiance to the king directly as part of their ordination oaths. Um, who are loyalists. Um, loyalist clergy are some of the most effective spokespeople for the loyalist cause during the revolution. This has come up recently in the Hamilton place. So this is this is the that image there on the on the right is um, the guy who plays Hamilton, um, who played in the original cast um, of Hamilton as Samuel Seabury. Um, but Seabury actually in that song makes a really good point and in his and the actual Seabury in his writings that Clay, you know, he says chaos and bloodshed are not the solution, right? So this is wait, 
let's remember the connections that we have. Let's remember legitimate government. And that's um, and, and so clergy people have to sort of do that taking of sides. In that process, the vast majority of clergy people on both sides of the Atlantic, of religious leaders beyond clergy people as well, so people who are actively communicating in these networks, those people choose the side of the government they're, they're with, right? The, the one exception to this is Anglican clergy. Um, the the uh, significant number of Anglican clergy in the colonies um, leave or side with the British. But overwhelmingly, in a broader sense, people side with the, the government that they're with, right? And so that taking of sides is a division. It's a division between those, um, those communities. And then there's just the destruction of the war. This is a you know an, a, a colonial era um, view of Philadelphia. You look at those those steeples, right? Um, churches were the um, the the largest and most substantial buildings in most um, in most colonial cities and most colonial towns, which means they are resource intensive buildings and they get used up and damaged in war. You know, sometimes like in Boston during the occupation of Boston, this was explicit, um, uh, Old South Church, which had been used as a center of, um, of protest, um, becomes a pigsty. It becomes a barracks and a pigsty specifically to show disrespect. Almost all of the Boston churches are, are um, damaged in that way, um, in, in you know, one way or another, very explicitly um, through disrespect. But that happens in, in lots of other places that are less explicitly political and are, are just about the resources. So there's a church on Long Island where the this place of large steeple gets taken down. Even the church has put all this money into this steeple. It gets taken down because it's made of wood and it's winter and the soldiers need the wood to keep themselves warm. Um, you know, churches used as barracks is a really common phenomenon uh, or as hospitals. Um, of course, in, in New York, um, the, there's a huge amount of, of destruction after the big fire in 1776. Um, also, the, um, the structures that had been King's College, now Columbia's College, um, the, they were used as barracks, even though the ministers who were there were loyal to the British Army and the British Army were using it as barracks. Um, you get people like, uh, like Seabury and, and um, Charles Inglis, another, another guy who's there writing about how frustrated they are that the British troops have like just thrown the libraries out the windows. Um, they have, you know, they've pilfered the books. They probably can't even read them. They've sold them off. They've burned them as, as fuel. Um, the scientific apparatus that they had so painstakingly, um, uh, you know, built up for, for King's College, and this is true actually for all the colleges, those scientific apparatus, those instruments, they could only be made in Europe that had been imported in the colonial era. They disappear and they're destroyed, right? So there's, there's this physical destruction of the apparatus of institutional religion that we can't underestimate because the problem it's going to cause is that then it has to be rebuilt. And the best example of this is Princeton. So Princeton University, the college of, college in New Jersey then, um, is, you know, there's a battle right on top of it, but there's also armies moving back and forth across it for a significant period of time. Um, and the, uh, its, its library is, again, destroyed. Its scientific apparatus is destroyed. It's in really bad shape at the end of the war. John Witherspoon, who had been in the Continental Congress, who signed the Declaration of, the, of Independence, he's president of Princeton, and he needs to start putting things back together. He actually had come when he was, you know, 20 years before or 15 years before as a younger man, he had been recruited from Scotland to come to Princeton because um, New Jersey Presbyterians believed that the only legitimate leader they could get that would be, you know, sort of theologically and in terms of leadership right for leading Princeton was one from Scotland. So they had very aggressively recruited Witherspoon from Scotland. And so he is himself a product of transatlantic um, networks, uh, his presence in Princeton, but also there have been a whole series of fundraising tours, including by Samuel Davies, who I talked about before, um, raising money for Princeton. Princeton is a transatlantic project. So Witherspoon and his colleagues decide to dip into that well again. Witherspoon's not sure it's going to be a great idea. He's actually pretty old and pretty infirm at this point. But he and, an, he and a colleague go to London and they try after the war to raise money for Princeton complete bust. This happens for Dartmouth also. Dartmouth Dartmouth College was, of course, is named after Lord Dartmouth, who was the Secretary of State for the Colonies before the war. Um, Dartmouth is also a product of, of um, transatlantic endeavors. Um, its president, Wheelock, goes over to, um, to raise funds. He like, he's there at the same time as Witherspoon, and no dice, there's no money. 
John Jay, who's then in um, who's then in Paris, writes to Witherspoon and says, "If we are an independent republic, we have to be able to fulfill these functions on our own. Before it was acceptable to raise money here, you just can't be asking people for money for our institutions at this point." So we get a severing of the financial networks after the war. It's not clear before the war that that's what's going to happen, and the Americans are kind of deluding themselves, thinking that the British are going to, you know, dip into their pockets to rebuild the battle scars. But it isn't really clear until after the war that, in fact, those planks have just been decimated. On the British end, um, religious philanthropy moves away from the colonies that they've been cut off from and pushed into places like the Caribbean and then into India, places that are loyal to the British Empire. So you just get this severing after the war. So those brings us, that brings us to the pieces, right? This mixed establishment is gone. These guardrails that kind of held the rules of toleration and the connections between church and state across the empire are gone. They've been destroyed by the war because the United States isn't a part of that system anymore. And the transatlantic networks are gone. So when the war is over, then people have to pick up the pieces. And this is the end of our story, right? If we've got a beginning, middle, and end, this is the conclusion. And it's, it's a conclusion that leaves us with not all the pieces being put together. So the pieces start, um, people start trying to pick up the pieces actually before the war is even over. And you see in, especially in 1775 and 1776, you see efforts to give the United States, this new country, a, and this, and this sermon is called the United Colonies, um, that to give this new country a, um, a religious meaning. Um, there are some very successful, very widely observed days of fast and Thanksgiving in 75 and 76, um, when people are, are sort of pulling together. As the war progresses, however, that kind of starts to fall apart. And the way that we can see it fall apart the most clearly is with the Articles of Confederation government. So the Articles of Confederation government, Congress starts drafting immediately after the, um, immediately after the, uh, um, Declaration of Independence, although it's not ratified for quite a long time after that. And in its initial drafting, one of the people who's on the drafting committee um, attempts to put in a lengthy article that will guarantee religious freedom for this new country. He's, you know, he, John Dickinson, he's an enlightenment thinker. He believes religious freedom needs to be the outcome of this, this struggle for freedom, right? Exactly, all, for all kinds of freedom. It's kind of a vaguely defined freedom. And he wants religious freedom to be in there. He tries to draft this article. It's a very, very long article. Um, it's also the first gender neutral statement of rights um, in, in this sort of genre of rights drafting. Um, this one, he explicitly includes men and women. So that's, that's a significant moment. Um, however, the article as a whole is a failure. And the reason is he knows that these different colonies can't, they are, you know, as they're becoming states, they're not going to abandon their traditions and their systems. Each state, each separate entity has its own heritage, its own religious systems, its own dominant groups and minority groups. And he can't just say everywhere is gonna have religious freedom. It's clearly not gonna work, especially in New England, right? You can't just eliminate all of that. A lot of people still believe you need some sort of guardrails, right? So he tries to grandfather those things in and then he says, no new laws can be passed, but that doesn't quite make sense because they're gonna to have to pass new laws because they're not British colonies anymore. And, it, he submits it to the committee and it just gets gets eliminated. The only statement about religion in the Articles of Confederation is a statement in Article 3 that the states will go to war on behalf of each other if they are attacked on account of religion, right? It doesn't really define what that is. So religion is something worth fighting for. However, we don't really know who's in and who's out or what that religion looks like. That's really pretty symbolic of where things are headed. The real work actually happens at the state level. Um, you know, we famously remember Thomas Jefferson's pride in his um, statute of religious freedom for Virginia. Um, Virginia has a very difficult time disestablishing the Church of England. They sort of stopped paying for it, and this happens in a whole lot of places. The easiest thing to do is to stop paying your clergy, right? But then as you go forward, what does this actually mean? So can churches, um, can colonial church, can state churches inherit the, um, the lands that were paid for by colonial taxation, for instance. Isn't that a hereditary privilege? Um, or questions over um, if schooling has traditionally be done by, been done by religious leaders, how is that going to function in the new place? And each state has to work through this through on their own. 
Um, South Carolina is a particularly interesting example. They, uh, in a 1778 constitution, they attempt to, they say they're going to establish the Protestant religion. They, those, that's the phrase they use. Um, and then they get into the business of, of trying to define what a legitimate Protestant group is. Um, how many people have to be a part of it for it to be a legitimate group? Do they have to have public worship or are you allowed to lock your doors on your church? Um, and what kind of oversight of religious leaders does the state have to have? And they get into all of this business, you know, these lengthy statements trying to figure out what's going to define religious legitimacy. And in the end, the states generally default to eliminating these restrictions, to moving towards religious freedom. Now, there is a real intellectual movement towards religious freedom among religious elites, but there's also a very serious practical problem with trying to work this stuff out. Um, and so the default is to remove religious restrictions sort of across the board. The most interesting piece of this that sticks, and it sticks in the Massachusetts 1780 Constitution for a very long time, is that is uh, limits on religious freedom that require religious leaders to, or religious communities to demean themselves peaceably. That's the phrase they use. So you have to have a peaceful demeanor towards the state. So the one thing they are fairly clear on is that whatever religious freedom is, it doesn't extend to religion being a threat to the state. Um, and that kind of, that's the one piece of that other settlement they can, um, they can pull back in. And I'll make a plug here to say this, this process of disestablishment at the state level is incredibly complicated and long and doesn't only happen in the 13 colonies. It happens in Vermont, which creates and then dismantles its establishment. It happens in, in, in former Spanish and French colonies that had different kinds of establishments. And this project, um, was done over the last few years, really looking creatively at that process. Um, and this book just came out last year that sort of summarizes all of that and really kind of opens up what this process means. For my purposes, the most important thing is that this takes decades. If this is not a quick fix at the end of the revolution. So the last piece of this is the federal constitution, the last piece that has to get picked up. As you know, the federal constitution, even before the First Amendment officially disestablishes or officially prohibits a federal establishment, um, the, the constitution has vir says virtually nothing about religion. Um, the major exception being that it does say there will be no, re no religious tests for office at the federal level. It's actually symbolically really important because the Glorious Revolution is almost exactly a century before. And the Glorious Revolution is, if nothing else, a religious test for political office, right? A Popish prince cannot be head of a Protestant people. And so James II has to go. So a century later in the colonies, they are saying no, no religious tests for office. And that's a little bit controversial for some people who are really nervous about a papist being a Catholic, being in um, elected to federal office, or somebody who's an atheist. Atheists actually have started to become as scary as papists for some people. Um, so, but in the absence of a federal structure, what we get instead is individual choice on the part of political leaders. So it becomes a test for constituencies to see in what way will the federal government, will the people in the federal government embody some sort of religion that resonates with those people. It becomes a test. So a great example is Washington's inauguration. When Washington is inaugurated, he, um, the, the people who are putting together the ceremony, they can't agree on whether there should be a chaplain there or not. The actual, the issue is that the, I think it's the Senate has appointed its chaplain, but the House has not. So it's actually a fight over who's going to take precedence there. They decide Washington should go to a church service. He does go to a church for the Episcopalian Church, which is what he's a part of, the successor to the Church of England in, in Virginia. Um, but there's no sermon. So there's no kind of official statement from a religious leader about the meaning of the inauguration. And then, of course, famously, Washington himself chooses to use the term, so help me God. It's not something that's in the oath. So he brings, and then his inaugural address, he also brings in a lot of religious language and relig image, religious imagery. That's his choice, right? So, and he could have chosen to go in a different direction as some of his successors have done. Um, and so that it becomes a, a matter of the character of the person rather than the nature of the office. That's kind of the settlement. And we see this also in the, the, um, the fast day. So there had been a kind of a, um, it's actually Thanksgiving. There had been a, um, uh, there's a big break between the early, um, 
days of fasting and thanksgiving and then they sort of pitter out and stop and then in the new federal constitution um congress actually asks washington to declare a day of of thanksgiving at the end the successful conclusion of the first um first congress washington's actually really nervous about doing it because he thinks it looks european it looks monarchist he doesn't really want to and the language that he put in this statement he says uh whereas both houses of congress have by their joint joint committee requested me to recommend this to the people of the united states so so he's not taking the initiative, he's acting on behalf of Congress, and that's really important to him. So we get this kind of very conflicted heritage coming out of the American Revolution in terms of the place religion has had. This image in the background here, the image that's on the cover of my book, which I just absolutely love, is a, a really great embodiment of the British imperial system, right? So we have one man who this, he's actually attacking Boston in this image, but one man who is both a bishop and a soldier, right? So we have these, these two arms, these two halves of this body put together in one. What we get at the end of the story for the United States is this actually divided into two separate visions. What is the relationship between church and state in the United States? As those pieces have fallen apart, the people in the early United States do not have an answer to that question. They're gonna to have to work it out over the course of their history. And the truth is we haven't worked it out. We are still arguing for or arguing about it. Is there a wall of separation between church and state in the United States? Or is it absolutely essential that this is a Christian nation, a Protestant nation, and the freedoms that we enjoy through the constitution, including religious freedoms, require us to be a Protestant nation. Those are two competing visions that reflect that history in the revolution, and they're still with us today. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Carte. I can hear the, the virtual clapping going <laughs> on right now. Why don't we go move on to the Q&A? We do have questions that have already been submitted by some of our audience members, and I would encourage everyone to continue to submit those questions. We'll be monitoring the Q&A as well as the chat through the next 15 minutes or so, and we'll look for any additional questions you have. So to start things off, how did you become interested in this subject and where did the idea for the book come from? So that is such a great question. And, you know, for any project you work on for a long time, it's a lot of questions coming together. Um, but the two that really that really stood out were the difference between a kind of international first grade awakening. We talk about how invested people in the first grade, grade awakening were in these transatlantic communities. And then a second grade awakening, which, um, you know, in textbooks certainly is really conveyed as a nationalistic event. And I was confused about that. And the more I started thinking about it, I got to the second thing, which is the French Alliance. So, so many people were deeply invested in being Protestants. Um, religious leaders and, and rank and file people, that was the language of warfare in the 18th century for, um, for British subjects. So how did those people so rapidly accept help from the French? Um, and so that was, that was a piece of the story that I, that I really needed to figure out. So that's a great nugget. And particularly coming from the background of the American Revolution Institute, you know, we spend a lot of our time focusing on the war itself and all of its different um, ebbs and flows and characters and legacies. So do you talk about the French Alliance in your book and, and sort of what do you conclude about that question you posed? I, you know, I do. Um, there's a couple different pieces to the story. Um, uh, you know, so religious leaders who have sided with the Americans are super excited to get French help because it's clear that they're, you know, they're all in with this as a, as a fight. They do some really interesting kind of rhetorical things with trying to understand what's going on. So they don't say, this is wonderful, we're now fighting with Catholics. What they say is, isn't it ironic that the French king, his most Christian majesty, the French king, is a better guardian for liberty than this, um, than the than King George, right? Or they um they talk about the opportunity to demonstrate Protestant liberty to the French soldiers who are coming. So they try to look for for ways like that. Loyalists and people in England have the easy job, right? So the fact that the colonists first rebelled, which is a, you know, it's a violation of of um of the you know religious duties to obedience, they rebelled and then they took took help from the French. Well, clearly, they are outside the sort of the moral framework. So it gives a lot of ammunition both to loyalists and to the French. Very good. 
Um, actually sticking with the French subject for a minute, we have a question from Peter. In your research, how much did you run across Huguenots and in your story and you know, what, what kind of a role did they play in the religious communities you looked at um, and then these various parts of, of imperial Protestantism? That is such a great question because I really wanted there to be a lot of Huguenots in the story. I assumed there would be coming from um, an earlier 18th century perspective. Um, and I have to say, Owen Stanwood has just done a great book on the on the Huguenots, if anyone um, uh, is looking for work on that. So the Huguenot moment is earlier. It's, a, it's in that period of kind of, um, of, of creating this Protestant sentiment or Protestant settlement. And the Huguenot community in general chooses to work within establishments in different places. So they kind of ally themselves with those establishments. And over time, they cease to be as distinctively separate in many places. There's some Huguenot um, communities in places like um, South Carolina. But um, Jacob Duche, who actually, who's, whose grandfather was a Huguenot refugee um, in Philadelphia, he's a great example. So um, his grandfather's a Huguenot refugee. His father decides to conform to the Church of England in Philadelphia, and then he becomes a Church of England um, clergyman. Um, you do see actually in, in the structures of imperial Protestantism in Britain in particular, there's a really strong Huguenot presence in all these voluntary societies. And I do think that they have a stronger internationalist sensibility than a lot of other groups do. So they're, they're very visible, particularly in Britain, um, but they don't have a distinctive position when it comes to the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, so question from Hugh about fairly early on in your presentation, the story about the Reverend Samuel Davies in Virginia. Was his warm reception partly due to the Scots-Irish, presumably Presbyterians, in the Shenandoah Valley in the western part of the colony, or was he working more widely in the, in the colony of Virginia? He, so that is that is such a perfect question because you know this this acceptance of him as a Presbyterian is linked in some way to Presbyterians being Scots, right? That, that that's what makes them loyal is that they're they're part of that settlement. And so um, he and other Presbyterians who are working in Virginia are most successful when they're in those kinds of communities. And yes, that's that is where he's operating. Um, the Baptists. Twenty years later, the Awakening movement shifts more towards Baptists in the South. Um, and that gets to more towards the 1770s and 1780s. And they don't get the benefit. They're, they're kind of within the system, but they're kind of on its fringes. And they don't get the benefit of that Scottish connection. And they face much greater opposition. Mm -hmm. So looking here at a question from Newton about sort of the average, on the average person level, Tories versus Patriot communities if you can really kind of boil it down that way. Did you see differences if you kind of looked that far down between those communities and how they reacted to kind of their, you know, religious kind of pushes and pulls during the revolution um, or their religious leaders in those communities um, kind of relating themselves differently to this more imperial British system? You know, this is, so that is really one of those kind of, that's the nub of the question, right, is the connection between lot, you know, large numbers of people and how they made their choices about the revolution and this, you know, and religion, and particularly the way I talk about religion, I'm talking about transatlantic institutions, right, I'm talking about structures of government, there's a reason the subtitles in imperial history, I'm looking at those high level connections, um, because I think that's where most of the action is for the, for the process of the revolution. But when we're looking at local communities, there's a way that religion is operating almost tribally. And with this, I'll, I'll refer to um, some of your, um, some of you may have seen, Virginia Anderson has a recent book about Nathan Hale and Moses Dunbar and what brings them into the war. You know, so these are two men from similar communities who are both executed in Connecticut for their, um, for their participation in the revolution. One executed by the British, one executed by the Patriots. And one is Anglican and is a part of sort of the Anglican networks in Connecticut, which are intensely loyal and one is um, is sort of congregationalist, although Nathan Hale's not particularly political and he's not particularly religious, right? So, but he's he's in communities that are embracing the revolution. And that's, so that book is a, does a wonderful job of showing how revolutionary allegiances follow, in many places, they follow communities. They're less sort of abstract political things than they are 
you know, this is, these are the people I'm around. And those networks overlap really strongly with religion. And that makes a makes it difficult for us to say, you know, sort of this theology is what's driving, you know, so congregationalists must have read Jonathan Mayhew's sermon about unlimited, you know, unlimited submission, and therefore, they're more likely to be patriots. Well, maybe it's just that everybody in New England is both congregationalists, or most people in New England are congregationalists, and most New Englanders are on board with the revolutionary movement. And so it's, that it gets to be a chicken and egg. But if you're if you're yeah. interested in that question, I'd say that the um it's the the martyr and the traitor. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Wonderful, wonderful, good, good recommendation. So you had talked about um the influence that you could you would assume that clergymen have over their congregations because of that kind of emotional pull of, of their religious communities. I have a question from Paul um, about South Carolina near the end of the Revolutionary War, which, you know, like other parts of the South, really, you know, broke into vicious civil war between local communities. And he asked, you know, it seems the churches and clergy of South Carolina had little to no influence over this extra military violence. Why, perhaps, did the church not seem to have more of a moderating influence over this these kind of violent, revenge-prone um, attacks during the war. You know, I think that's a that's a great way to think about how limited the influence of clergy probably were. Um, you know that. Uh, how, how limited it probably was. Um, so in South Carolina, that's one of the places where there's a Church of England establishment. And so that establishment is is relatively limited. It's not that limited, but it's relatively limited before the war. And then a lot of those of those Anglican clergy have left. And so there's just an absence of clergy on one level. Although there are, you know, there are other um, religious leaders, actually, when the South Carolina government wants to get more people on board with something they're doing, they get a committee of um, a Presbyterian and a Baptist and somebody else to go out and try and get the backcountry folk to get on board. So they, even though South Carolina legislature thinks that religious leaders will be effective at this, you know, when they're on that listening tour, um, William Tennant is one of these people, when they're, um, when they're out on that listening tour, they keep talking about how nobody's listening to them. So I think there's a, um, when the when push comes to shove in the crisis, and particularly when things have broken down into that level of war, people's trust in representations of authority have broken down. And so the influence of clergy people as abstract representations of authority have fractured. So your particular clergyman might still be powerful to you because you're still loyal to him as an individual, but kind of as a group, they're not going to have any particular voice. Okay. Uh, a question from Wayne, thinking of, I, I don't know if you looked at the military, the Continental Army itself as a religious community with its kind of system of chaplains and regiments. He's curious what impact, if any, did those chaplains in the Continental Army have on the soldiers or you know, the army itself, religion and the military in the revolution? So this is a fascinating subject that I think we know a lot less about than we ought to. There have been some efforts to um, catalog um, the clergy, the chaplains in the in the military, but as I'm sure you all know, the the diversity of units and the different ways that people served makes it very difficult to kind of pull all that together. Um, certainly, uh, Washington and other other um, high level leaders were big fans of the clergy and 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 wanted chaplains to bring discipline, to bring morale. When we have diaries of chaplains, um, they seem to be very engaged in what they're doing, and they're you know they care a lot about the the men. Who who are fighting and the you know they're one can imagine that they're a pretty vibrant pastoral presence but they're not consistently there enough and the institution itself of the military is in enough of a state of evolution that i think it's difficult to sort of draw any any big conclusions certainly there were periods where there were very few chaplains in some places and and units are not being drawn together for the purpose of religious unity mm -hmm. and so that's also going to be problematic sure um, so a uh, question from John um, about Catholics, who certainly were not specifically a part of your focus on um, British Protestantism, but during this period, you know, how was Catholicism tolerated in the colonies? How was that, uh, did, you, did, you, did that come into play into your story at all, or were there really too few present to play a role? So that's a great 
um, a great question. So Catholics play two really significant roles. One is that they are, so they're, they're not legally allowed to participate in civil life anywhere in the British empire before the, before the revolution. And so they're, they're really restricted in terms of what they can do for, for Catholics in the United States. Um, what Catholics do and also what Jews do is as the war is going on, they participate disproportionate to their numbers in the revolutionary cause, and they use their military participation and their loyalty to this revolutionary state to kind of pry open the space of civic participation. So the French alliance makes it really difficult for the United States to call itself a Protestant empire or a Protestant country. It can't, right? Because it's fighting with the aid of the French. And another thing that's happening is that they're getting support from Catholic soldiers. They're also trying to get support of the Quebecois when they can. And so Catholics gain a lot of rights, not because they're kind of theoretically granted to them as much as it's because they seize them, right? So that's the American side of the story. The British side of the story, I actually think is even more interesting. So the, the British government realizes that they need Catholic soldiers to fight the war. And so Catholic relief, you know, the, the British empire changes its rules for Catholics during the course of the war, which leads to a massive backlash in Britain. And the, you know, the worst riots in 18th century Britain happen, they're anti-Catholic riots, and they happen in 1780. And they happen because um, partly people blame it on the Americans and the French stirring up trouble, but also because the British government wants to, uh, wants to arm Catholics. Um, and of course, this is an Ireland problem. This is um, more than anything else. Very good. Um, the last question that we're going to have time for is from Eddie, and is about um, abolition. Does this British imperial Protestantism play a role in the British religious abolitionist movement? And is that disrupted or changed in any way by American independence? I thank you for that question, because that's a that's a, a piece of this that's really important to me. Um, one of the frustrations of working on 18th century religion is that uh, when you're talking about sort of institutional religion, is that, you know, the vast majority of the colonial figures I talk about own slaves, and they don't have any kind of meaningful anti-slavery critique. Um, although there are other people, you know, there are certainly Quakers who are making that critique, the, the criti there's lots of African Americans making that critique, right? So it's, it's not that they're not hearing it. It's that they say, if you're uncomfortable with slavery, do what you can to bring Christianity to enslaved people, right? So that's the party line. It's the disruption of the American Revolution that creates the political space between religious organizations and politics that allows the abolition movement to become a political movement. So, um, and I'm drawing on, on Christopher Brown, Brown's great book, Moral Capital here. There's a really important transition from anti-slavery sentiment to abolitionism, which is a political agenda, right? In order to be more than just like uncomfortable with slavery, you have to have a goal. And that goal comes together. There are you know, petitions for parliament, things like that. Those start in 1786 and 1787. And it comes through channels that have been disrupted. It's the space has opened up that allows religious leaders to be activists, be political activists. While they're in that establishment, they really can't speak truth to power for lack of a, lack of a better phrase, right? They don't have enough distance. Um, afterwards, they do have a little bit more distance and you start to see religious leaders saying, I have a moral teaching that may or may not match what you're, what this government says and I'm going to speak to that government. And the abolition movement is, is one piece of that. The American story is much more complicated because of course, huge percent, huge swaths of, of the United States still have slavery and clergy in those places tend to support slavery. Mm -hmm. I do think that's a really, really great place to end. And, and I think you've given a really wonderful presentation, lots of food for thought, and I hope a lot of incentive to, for everyone out there to pick up a copy of your book if they don't have it already. So thank you all, Dr. Carte, and all of our audience members for joining us this evening. As you leave the webinar, a survey from Google Forms will appear on your screen. Please take a few minutes to share your thoughts about tonight's program, as well as suggestions you have for other aspects of the revolution and its legacy that you think would make good future virtual presentations and hopefully in-person ones someday soon. <laughs> Your feedback, of course, is very helpful to us um, as we develop our future programming calendar. So thank you again for the time and the fascinating remarks, Dr. Carte, and everyone for your attendance this evening. Good evening, hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you all for listening.